So I'm just going to quickly ask them all to introduce themselves to you. So, Kevin, do you want to start at this end, please? <clears throat> Kevin McLaughlin, um, AV manager at the Royal Society of Medicine and also a director of the uh, AV user group. You pass the mic along, thanks. My name is Lucas Dudo. I work for AVMI as a networked AV solution architect. Hi there, uh, John English from Deutsche Bank. I'm, what am I this week? I'm a principal technology manager and architect. <laughs> I've, I've had various different roles within the bank. Um, run AV, unified communications, and uh, working on various different technology challenges today. Hi, and uh, Rob Owen from Deloitte. I'm the uh, AV manager there for uh, UK and Switzerland. My name is Daniel Lee. I'm the managing director of Ushot International for Europe. Uh, we are technology consultants. Hello, I'm uh, John Thompson from Barclays, and I'm the head of strategy for collaboration services. Thank you. So, um, obviously, there's uh, a multitude of challenges um, around this space. Um, and uh, we're going to try and touch on at least some of them. I don't think we're going to cover all of them. Um, one of the ones that I recall uh, particularly a, a challenge uh, in the days that I was an end user uh, was around the actual process uh, that you have to go through um, in, in bringing new technologies into the business because not every manufacturer or supplier does it in the same way. Um, and that's often where uh, consultants and systems integrators come into the mix. So I'm going to start off with you, Dan, if you don't mind, if you can grab the mic off John. Um, obviously, as a consultant, you probably experience this directly, uh, where you have clients that have good relationships with some manufacturers and others that have none at all, um, and you very much come into play as the, as the organisation that's going to introduce the technologies and then help that client deal with those challenges. Um, can you maybe share some of your experiences in this area with us? Sure. I think the interesting thing uh, on this topic is that end users naturally will align themselves with a number of manufacturers because they standardise on certain system types and manufacturers for a number of years. What that means potentially is that their relationships with those manufacturers are very strong and their relationships with other manufacturers maybe aren't as strong. So when at times the time comes for them to go to market to start researching new possible standards, it's very easy for them to get engagement with the manufacturers they already know, but potentially n not so easy for them to get uh, engagement from those other manufacturers that they historically haven't spoken to for a while. And what we're able to do, I guess, is facilitate those introductions maybe a little bit more quickly and get the end users in at the right level of the manufacturer organisations to start having meaningful discussions from the beginning rather than attempting to work their way back up building relationships through the, uh, through the manufacturer organisation. Uh, with, with manufacturers that have been historic and maybe in place for a number of years, do you find them open to change? when you introduce uh, new relationships with new, new manufacturers, uh, ultimately for their benefit to, to help them bring products in that are going to meet the needs that they have, I assume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. One of our primary responsibilities as consultant, as an external advisor, is to challenge the status quo. It's to talk to an end user about what they're doing, why they're doing it, are they still doing it for the right reasons. Um, I think where it's, it's tricky is that what an established relationship brings is very good levels of support. Um, and end user organisations are often worried that they've for, you know, built up 10 years of relationship with manufacturer X, that they have them performing in exactly the way they want them when it comes to resolving issues, and will they get that by moving over to another manufacturer? So there's a lot of responsibility on new manufacturers. When we come to them and say, right, this client is historically manufacturer X, they would like to talk to you, manufacturer Y. There's huge responsibility on that manufacturer Y to engage properly and to demonstrate that th the service level is available and that they're interested in the engagement. I think the procurement process adds a, a, a new element in that you know, procurement teams are often insistent that end users go to market and look at a number of solutions. Um, even if potentially there isn't a huge appetite to switch away from the current standard. And what that means is the manufacturers who aren't the incumbent receive lots of inquiries that potentially are just there to tick procurement boxes. Um, and so they get wary 
And so when you do come to them, you have to say, no, really, this time they do want to talk to you. They are interested. Um, and that's a, that's a separate challenge. So, Jonathan, could you, um, obviously, as an end user, you must understand what that, that experience feels like. You've got existing relationships, you have standards, you've got manufacturers that you have good relationships with, but obviously you're always looking to meet the needs of your users as they move forward and their requirements change. Um, and how do, you, how do you balance that, the, the risk of moving away from those relationships and building new relationships and particularly to the point that Dan made about the, the, the level of service, how important is that in that, uh, in that consideration when you're looking at that? Um, I think that the level of service is incredibly important and I think yeah, Dan brings a good point that the new vendor, they've got a lot to do to almost like catch up with, with the incumbents. Um, but on the, on the flip side of that, going to new vendors, you can often find you get better relationships. There's, there's more incentive to, to, to do more. You know, I'm not saying you know, vendors can get... You're a jaded supplier versus a supplier that's excited to get a new client. Yeah, yeah and, you know, there's, there's plenty of jaded ones, I'm sure, that have dealt with me. Um, but, but yeah, you can, you can refresh relationships when you do that. I think Dan's point about the procurement process can be particularly painful. Um, it's certainly from, from an internal perspective, there are times you just want to get on with the job or you want to select a particular technology. And you do have to go through these. these and then they're, they're there for a reason. So you, you have to go through this. It's, it's, yeah, it's kind of check boxes, but, but we are being serious when we put these things out. And I think manufacturers don't often get that, even if we then do stay with an incumbent. Um, the, the balancing of the risk, I think in part is making use of consultants when it makes sense. You know, there are times when we'll just go straight out to the vendor community and we'll, we'll do the selection ourselves. But in a lot of cases, going through a consultant, that, that's one way of de-risking the situation because they're doing things for you, they're checking these things out, they're communicating with the manufacturer, and they'll have previous experience with that manufacturer as well. The other part around de-risking it is making sure that you're using um, good integration partners, I think, as well. And that, that's key, is making sure you're selecting partners who aren't also stuck or more experienced with one manufacturer versus another. So you can, you can de-risk at a number of different levels. And as I say, I think consultants and integrators are a big part of managing that risk for organisations such as ours. OK, thanks. So Rob, John and Jonathan, the three of you work for global organisations. Um, and I'm sure all three of you, your organisations now have global standards, certainly for a lot of standard meeting spaces that uh, uh, you have around the world. So how difficult does that challenge become when today we definitely don't have uh, global systems integrators? Uh, even working with some manufacturers, getting global support is difficult. Uh, how, how big is that challenge uh, when you come to adopting uh, new technologies? Maybe, John, do you want to pick up on this one? Yeah, I mean, global standards are very important for us. Um, simplifying the environment, making it really easy for colleagues to use uh, is critical, especially in the AV uh, and collaboration domain. Um, so we strive to set um, sort of user experience standards and then uh, the capabilities that align to that and then the products. And we have a big challenge, which is to keep the number of products to a minimum so that it's cost-effective, easy to support, um, reliable, and a great experience. But then we've got to make it fit for purpose. So it's really uh, a portfolio management job in terms of getting that right optimization point between too many products and services making it confusing uh, and unreliable and expensive versus making it too standardized and it's no good for anyone. You know, on average, everyone's unhappy. So it's a critical part of the role, being able to balance that. And then the additional complexity, as you say, is that uh, you can't get all the services and the products in all the countries that we exist in. We're in over 120 countries um, with uh, a significant distribution internally of our own businesses. They're all separate and have their own wants and needs. So when you add those two together, it's quite a challenge. Um, and we spend a lot of time, uh, and we're doing that right now, designing our new campuses around the world, uh, really trying to select the right products and services and vendors to do that. Um, it'd be great if there was one big Uber provider, 
Uh, that would make life really easy for us, but um, there's not. And uh, so we spend a lot of time managing that. So that's still a significant challenge yeah. in a, yeah. in a, when you're trying to adopt something that's, especially something that's new that you're bringing into the environment, even if it's working with an existing manufacturer, just delivering yeah. it um, and finding the right partners to work with. Yeah, I, I would say what, one of the things that historically maybe not a lot of attention was put into was the impact of change. Right? So change brings great value, there's no doubt. But when you're introducing a new product or service into a global organization, you have to really carefully think about that. Um, how is it going to have success so that it's transitioned in the right way, that colleagues see it as a benefit and not a confusing uh, addition to the portfolio? And that when you do implement it, that it is a success that you don't make a hash of it, right? So you want consistency in all the locations that you're deploying in. Um, and then you understand the impact in terms of being able to do the complete support chain end to end and the impact on your cost base end to end. So that, that impact analysis, user adoption, and really putting a lot of effort into that and working with your partners. Um, and that's where you've got control of it. When um, our partners in the industry decide to change things and drop support for things and make things a little bit different in a way that we weren't expecting, then that can bring some unexpected trauma. Um, and so working closely uh, with our internal clients and with the industry is really important to try and, one, provide feedback so products can be developed um, in, in line with sort of what, what customers will want to buy, but also to try and avoid those real traumatic points of change where suddenly, uh, I think, you know, medium room systems are a great example. You go to standard one, you just get it deployed in 20,000 meeting rooms, and then version two comes out. It's not compatible with version one. Crisis zone, right? You know, new user interface, new training material, new cost base, new licensing mechanism. It's just a disaster, yeah. So uh, thank you for that, Jonathan. Um, Lucas, let's come to you. Obviously, you work at a systems integrator, so you're between you're between the rock and the hard place, right? You're between the client that you're trying to deliver the service for and you're, you're working with uh, whether it's consultants and manufacturers or one or the other. Um, and a, a, an organisation like a Barclays or a Deloitte or a Deutsche Bank that are global presence and they would like the service delivered globally for them and that's still a challenge for most organisations today. How are AVMI approaching that with some of their global clients today? Um, and how much of a challenge is that, to, uh, especially in the space of uh, when they're looking to adopt new technologies? Um, right, so yeah, we do have some customer we actually have to support globally. Um, so let's say some financial institutions. Um, therefore, we've opened new offices in Hong Kong. We've opened a new office in New York. Uh, we've developed a network of local AV partners which can help us support local uh, branches or local offices. Um, plus, uh, with new technologies which allow us you know, to monitor or to proactively actually um, help our customers remotely over the network, um, that, help us on, on daily, that, that helps on a daily basis, definitely. However, as you say, there are loads of challenges. Uh, because we are being swamped with, you know, with new presentations, with new technologies, with new products, uh, and we have to filter it out. Uh, very often, um, it, asks, it is us, actually, who uh, have to prepare um, something completely new for a customer. A customer just gives us a brief. Um, so we have to have knowledge of those new technologies. And that is actually uh, taking you know, our time taking, uh, taking, uh, taking our money actually as well, because you have to train everyone from pre-sales uh, through commissioning engineers um, and guys in the service department. And that can be really time consuming, especially with so many different products being released, you know, every year. And as you said, a new version can be completely incompatible uh, with the previous one, it is a challenge, definitely. I, I came and uh, I came and saw AVMI's premises probably seven or eight years ago as part of a vetting process uh, to do work for Morgan Stanley when I was there. 
uh, and they had a lab facility where they tested product. I'm interested to know, is, does that lab still exist? Do you still use it for that purpose? Did it become impractical because of the pace of technology change? I am with AVMI for not that long, to be honest. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure whether uh, the current test lab we are having is exactly the same you could see. But, but is, it, is it used for new technologies that are launched, or is it more about supporting technologies that you have in existing clients? We do have installations. a few people within, uh, within AVMI, including myself, who are actually responsible for valuation of new products. So we would, uh, we would play with those products. We will try to find, you know, uh, maybe not the bugs, but we, we, could, we try to find some weaknesses. We try to... Uh, provide feedback to manufacture because sometimes we are being asked actually to provide that feedback um, so We do spend quite actually Quite reasonable amount of time testing new technologies before we actually can offer those new products to our customers Okay, thanks Rob so at, at Deloitte when um when, when you're looking at uh, new standards, new technology for new standards, or new technologies for some client solutions, do you, do you tend to bring them into your own environment to lab test them? Or do you, do you lean on consultants or integrators or manufacturers to be doing that on your behalf, or, or a mixture of both? So, I mean, very much a mixture of both. Um, I mean, the, the, the first thing uh, that we would do from a, uh, from a technical point of view is, is making sure that it's going to deliver what the sales guy said it was going to do. Uh, and that's important before we put it into a, a, a user environment. Um, but the, the next key bit is the end user testing. So we, we, uh, we have a, a test team across IT that does um, uh, the, all, all sorts of testing. And some of that is the, is, is the meeting room environment. Um, and it's that particular feedback because you know we can do our job with you know the the, the integrators, the consultants, the manufacturers. We can think it's a great idea. Uh, it can even work exactly how it's specified. But then we suddenly find a user hits it and it just doesn't work for them. They just don't get on with it. They're scared of it. They're you know we have to then sometimes rethink. You know have we put too many features in? Do we need to scale this back? Are their needs actually simpler than what we thought they were? Um, so. The, the, the very probably the last critical bit, and we can't do it that often because you know that these users have got a job to do. Um, so we have to be quite careful about which technology we release to them, and we have to be pretty confident that it's that it's very close to what they are that what they're after. But it's definitely a balance. Thanks. So back to you. <laughs> um, so that brings up the question of uh, user interface usability. Um, and that's a, a massive discussion point around the industry at the moment. We hear people talking about it all the time. So with, with your clients, Dan, um, when you're going through this process, when, when does that come into play and how, how big a part of the conversation is that? So I think it's changing, and for us it's changed quite recently. Off the back of specific client feedback from a number of our end users, Rob included, um, we've actually moved premises recently and introduced um, a test lab type facility to our service portfolio. It's essentially a blank canvas space. It's about this sort of size, and the idea is that in it we can do a number of things. We can do familiarization with products for our own teams internally before we look to specify them. We can do product comparison, but we can also do system mock-ups. It occurred to me, you know, off the back of these various discussions, that our process at the moment, and the process of most consultants, is that we get to a point where we have a relatively detailed design, and then we say, okay, Mr. Client, go and buy 50 of these, and then once the integrator's built a couple, we'll go and show you one, and you can tell us if you like it or not. Obviously, by that point, it's a bit late. So what we're looking to do is introduce a step pre-procurement where we will, with the support of manufacturers, mock up that system, take it from paper to real life and allow users to come and have a play with it. The first one we've done was recently, it was very interesting. It's for a building that's being shared by three 
um, different partner organisations, a university and two car manufacturers. Um, and they have collaborative meeting rooms. So they have three very different sets of standards. They have three different laptops, three different laptop builds, three different soft phone clients, three different UC platforms, and they all want to share a meeting room. So a perfect example of a situation where the value, there is value in us mocking that up and saying, right, one of you from each organisation, please bring your laptop in, connect it to this room, and let's see what happens. We did that on Monday. It, it pretty much worked, but there were some things that we needed to tweak, and also there was some communication that the partner organisations realised they needed to do around the time of their move to tell their users specifically how their devices would work with those rooms. So in the space of that day... You know, we borrowed the equipment from the manufacturers. The cost was not significant to the users, but the value was absolutely enormous. Um, I think very much now what we're designing is experiences over systems. I think that's the general ethos of the industry at the moment. But we're in a world now where the plug-and-play-ish nature of what we do, especially in a typical meeting room, means that we can think much more about the experience. How does it feel to the user? What actually happens when they plug in? So we can take the focus off the boxes until the end of the process, and we can spend a lot more time, like I say, on that experience bit, which is more valuable. OK, thank you. I want to come to you for a minute, Kevin. Um, you, at the Royal Society of Medicine, your challenges are probably very different to some of those that we've talked about already. Your, uh, you don't have the uh, global coverage to worry about. Um, you, you run a very different uh, uh, operation in that you're running events often for other people that are coming in and using the facilities and often the people that are using the systems are your own techs running the events for the clients of the Royal Society. So what do you find the challenges are when you're adopting new technologies? Is it just the sheer chase of, uh, pace of change or are there different challenges that you find you come up against in this area? Um, and just as you said, we have uh, paying customers, as it were, using our venues. So, obviously, there, there is no uh, room for error, you know, so we have to mitigate risk in, in the best way that we can because if somebody's paid tens of thousands of pounds of a live event at the RSM, then, um, you know, if a system fails or doesn't meet the, the client's needs, then there is a price to pay uh, in reputation as well as financial. Um, I mean, how we mitigate that is by having a strong in-house team, uh, well-trained and, and, and very uh, technical, who will test uh, on-site a lot of kit before we actually let it loose on the, on the users. Um, we're not at the same advantage where if you're a global organisation, you could uh, dedicate perhaps uh, a certain branch or a certain section of rooms to a new technology. Um, so sometimes there is a high risk in introducing uh, new technology and that's when, as we talked earlier about relationships um, with a consultant or an integrator uh, or a manufacturer, um, it would be very risky to start you know, those three new relationships um, with a new product. So if it is a new manufacturer, then if you've already got a strong relationship with an integrator and you trust them and you know that you're going to get the support, that could mitigate the risk. With, with the manufacturer. Um, but yes, you know, like a lot of end users, we've built relationships over several years with manufacturers and, and different integrators. And, and we would rely on those and have relied on those because we, we have introduced a lot of um, technology that was at you know, the cutting edge. And there is always a risk element. And you know, thinking about it nine times out of 10, it's probably not best to be the guinea pig. But um, when it, you are the guinea pig, you make it work, and actually, if there was a compelling reason for it, um, for example, the user case uh, for bringing in that technology um, was strong. So when you actually get the result, um, it's very satisfying. But we have been in a situation where uh, many other organizations have learned from our um, uh, efforts uh, with new technology, and it's not a comfortable place to be. Do you find you lean more on the systems integrators to support you where you are rather than consultants or do you do you use both? Um, so we, we don't haven't used um, consultants uh, recently but I, I would also throw another uh, entity in, in, into the mix and that's the distributor. Mm -hmm. um, 
specifically with some of the technology we've used, where a distributor has uh, really uh, specialised in it, uh, they've actually, we focused on their support as opposed to the integrator, because we don't have um, what we might call an incumbent uh, integrator for different projects. So it might be a different integrator every time, which can introduce um, elements of risk. So therefore, if the distributor is the same, then you've always got that um, core support uh, that brings it all together. Do, do, you, do you find that's happened for you because you don't, you don't get the opportunity to build a relationship direct with a manufacturer? So the distributor tends to step in on their behalf and support you with the integrator to do that? Or has that just come about for a different reason? Just maybe product selection, the type of products that you were using? Um, I would say both. Uh, we have built very strong relationships with manufacturers, usually the smaller ones, the newer ones, because we're quite a small um, organization. We don't have the power of a global um, the financial organization that can obviously has got that possibility of multiple purchases but um, we've also built relationships with very um, uh, large manufacturers so I, I would say it works in, in both situations okay thanks um, I was going to move on to the actual uh, development of the products themselves because um, uh, it's again it's an interesting topic um, manufacturers directly through consultants, through distributors, through systems integrators, are always looking to get feedback from the industry to develop products in the right direction. Um, I'm interested to know where you find it, it works best. So is that, do you, do you tend to get better results working directly with the manufacturer in isolation, uh, through a consultant or a systems integrator, or in collaboration maybe with other end users that have similar requirements uh, maybe through a group like the AV user group, as an example. Uh, Jonathan, maybe you'd like to uh, comment. Yeah, um, I mean, we've, got, we've done a lot of this over the years and going in at you know, real ground floor level with a number of vendors or manufacturers and even helping some manufacturers become manufacturers from, from a basis of being essentially just consultants and building one-offs. Um, there's, there's a lot of benefit from doing it yourself and being right in there with them and only working on your requirements, I think, because you, you need to be able to focus at that point. You've really got to you know, help that manufacturer understand what it is you want. I think there's a, there's a part that you've, you've got to do that with an eye to the rest of the market. Um, it's, it's never been particularly formal. I think the AV user group is a great way of, of us doing that. We've, we've either done it formally with, with the user group or just through the network that you get from being part of that group and being able to get together with people and create sort of small, just sort of ad hoc working groups almost just to understand what other people are doing. Uh, one of the difficulties with a lot of manufacturers um, and, and more, more the bigger manufacturers where, you know, we've, we've done this in the past with, with large companies where they've either got a new product line emerging or we're trying to push them towards something in the new product line is it would be good to have our consultants and our integrators involved at that stage, but the manufacturers find it very difficult to allow them to do that. You know, as a, as a customer, you can get a much deeper level of non-disclosure agreement than, you, than the, the vendors or the resellers or the integrators are allowed to have. So that can often become a sticking point. We've, we've tried to do this in the past and we've wanted you know, key integrators involved at a certain stage to help us get it right, and, and the manufacturers are, are very wary of doing that. So, you know, it's, you, it's, a bit of, it's a bit of all, you know, it's all of those. Yeah. But, but sometimes just having that focus on, on your requirements really helps. Do you think the manufacturers would benefit from maybe uh, working with more kind of open, I don't know, what, maybe you call them advisory councils that might be a mixture of potential clients or existing clients, maybe with some of the supply chain? And, and make it more of a formal process if they would be more successful I, rather than collecting the feedback from different clients in isolation and then trying to work out which features they bring into the product and develop and which they drop. And yes, I think that would, that would help a lot. I mean, user groups, you know, when sponsored by manufacturers, I've, I've not seen great results from a lot of those. You do from some, but I... It's, it's very much down to the manufacturers to how and who they get involved in it. So one company I found don't seem to do this very much in terms of going to groups of people to, to learn things, but are very good 
at taking on board of those things is Cisco. They've got a very, very strong and open product management group. You know, they're happy to come and talk to people and they're, they're, they're good at gathering those requirements and they're very good at then coordinating those and you know, taking, taking those and distilling them into a, a true set of requirements that they know will cover a particular market sector for what they're doing. But that, that's a key for the manufacturer's side of things is to ensure that product management get properly engaged in this. Um, some other companies, their product management can just be a bit of a, you know, a black hole that, you know, we're continually putting requests into certain companies and stuff just disappears and the, the pre-sales teams and even the product managers sometimes don't seem to have the relationships they need. So a lot of manufacturers, they've got to build relationships within their organisations in order for that, that product development to, to benefit from talking to the end users in that level of detail. Do you, do you experience the same, John, that Jonathan's describing, or do you have a, a, maybe a different view or a different experience? No, I, th I think it's um, pretty similar. We have, um, and my personal view is, there's the discovery of products, development of them, uh, and then the deployment of them uh, in the organization. So, you know, many different channels um, help us do that. I think the AV user group, we have discovered um, and engaged with many vendors and service integrators that we wouldn't have found normally. Um, it's, there's so many products out there. If you go outside of the mainstream, like the big Cisco's and the Microsoft, yeah, you know where they are. But when you're looking to plug the other gaps, in, especially in the collaboration domain, it's very hard to discover who is um, actually out there and got great products that we could consume. So the discovery channel is really important um, and many avenues for doing that, this being one of them. Uh, when we found products, there's normally issues with them. So for an enterprise, that will normally be compliance or regulation um, and maybe some features missing. And it's really great when we partner with a vendor um, to enhance that product. And we're normally pretty realistic. It's, you know, in terms of asking for stuff that we think other colleagues would want in the industry. You know, Jonathan, myself and other colleagues in the banking industry tend to get together and discuss things that are missing in product sets. And then we will all feed that into the Cisco's, the Microsoft's, um, a bit of a kind of uh, divide and conquer in, in that sense. But it's great when the vendors, you know, uh, respond, but we appreciate the product managers have got billions of requests to change them and make them specific to just what we want and need. Uh, and that's a partnership. You've just got to be realistic. And that's the really important part for us, which is realism. We know what we're going to get and we know what we're not going to get. Because if you sit there with certain vendors in the industry who tell you it's coming and you tell your clients that and it never comes, then your credibility is shot and, and that's very tough to deal with. So I think having a really good factual um, engagement and, and commitment on both sides is really important. And then the deployment, um, going back to the earlier part around trust and who you do business with. If you're deploying X thousand components with a criticality level of Y because you've committed to make certain spaces available and they're going to work really well. And what's really tough is you're more than likely going to give in all this service to people that are non-technical. So you've got this massive complexity. You've got a whole supply chain issue. And if you're in the collaboration space, especially meeting rooms, you're heavily in the, in the uh, real estate space. So there's a big commitment between you and a real estate team and a supplier and an integrator, making all that come together um, so that you can deliver the solutions in a fit for purpose way is extremely important. So a lot of time spent with the systems integrators um, and the supply chain is really important to build up that confidence level. So that's obviously, a, that's a big consideration when you're bringing new designs, incorporating new technologies into your environments is, the, is then the long-term support of those products and systems. Um, and, and in recent years, we've seen a, a big move on the systems integration side towards these uh, remote support uh, centers, VNOX, NOX, whatever you want to call them. And Rob, I think you mentioned that earlier. How big, a, a, how big a, an influence in your ultimate decision-making is that long-term support and the fact that you know more and more meeting rooms are getting technology in them and therefore the problem's only growing um, and therefore that support becomes a bigger problem and being able to centralize that support with the suppliers how big an issue or influencer is that in the process 
I mean, for, for us, it's a massive influence because the we're we're certainly uh, changing. Um, a, a lot of the support model, you know, we, we're quite heavy in the UK for, for desk size support, but if you took our Netherlands firm, uh, I think they've got one full-time uh, employee because it's all self-service. They're, you know, it, it's everything just has to work. Um, whereas, you know, we have, we're quite support heavy because either the user doesn't work or the technology doesn't work, but, you know, um, we have to be hands-on. And by, by moving into... Uh, a remotely supportable model it's hugely important to be able to put uh, equipment on the network um, uh, and make sure it fits in with all our other uh, IT monitoring platforms as well um, and by putting on the network there's challenges with security and you know what we're allowed to uh, what we're allowed to see and what we're not allowed to see uh, we had a, a recent issue where in our new building we tried to put in spotter cams a low resolution image to actually give the remote support desk a view of what was actually on screen you know was it blue dead you know what was there uh, and we just couldn't get it through our security and it, this was staying within our network but because they deemed that you know someone would have just that little bit too much access um, they said no now that makes you know a real challenge for us because actually if we're in the room we can see it so our level of support starts to come down. So to, trying to make sure that also uh, manufacturers are, are working towards systems that output as much information as possible, not to overwhelm a remote support person, but to give relevant data uh, and accurate data uh, is really important. The other issue we had had with uh, remote, remote support was uh, effectively the monitoring tools themselves, if they go down, you can have a working room, but you've got a load of alerts. And again, it's it's we're now looking how do we you know how do we overcome this? And you can't really monitor the monitor, but you know whatever you are monitoring has to be fairly accurate information, especially for a remote support desk to work well. So it's um, still a challenge for us. Why did the client say no to the camera? Was there a, was there a really good justification for that? We are. <laughs> We are risk averse. It's you know, uh, as we say, our, you know, our security team has no on the door. It's, it's. <laughs> it, I mean, it's a, that's a you know, it's a off the cuff joke there. But it, it, we have to, uh, as a company, um, we have uh, a lot of uh, different clients, all with their own compliance uh, that we have to meet in order to do business with them. Um, and it's uh, our, our re the reputational damage that any data leakage or, or anything, uh, anything that gets out has a huge impact on our business. You know, we could lose a client overnight, you know, uh, if we weren't careful. So it's, we're, we're trying to get more of a sensible conversation to really understand risk, you know, because it's, risk is all about balance, you know, looking at the likelihood of something happening against the removing the functionality because, you know, we can't tie our users down and never let them leave the office because god forbid they might lose their laptop um but for the spotter camera it was it was just deemed that the remote desk had just enough information that they should be able to help a user enough um and we just couldn't get it across the line but it was a shame on, on that one it's, it's an interesting challenge because i mean we've been able to do that we've put spotter yeah. cameras into various um, countries around the world and typically the, the barrier we have for what we've put in at the final hurdle is whether there are any kind of data protection restrictions you know anybody in the finance world as soon as you say Germany everyone says workers council and the, the eyes roll to the top of the head but um, you can do this but there's there's a part where manufacturers you know can play in this and they, they really need to I think is because when you do do these security reviews of these kind of devices and as we did when we were looking to put spotter cameras in and so many other kinds of devices that are now able to go on the network and the manufacturer says great you can monitor this and you know yet another monitoring tool which is another challenge where people need to or manufacturers you know would be better so to look at the kind of monitoring tools that organizations already have and how they integrate their products with those rather than a, another piece of software for the for the ever increasing dashboard that the, the NOC has to use but there are a lot of, I wouldn't say security flaws, but the approach to security from a lot of manufacturers is so wide ranging from almost nothing to 
thinking that there's a security model, but you don't have to scratch very far before you find right, really quite considerable holes in it. And often, you know, security teams, you hand it to them and, you know, they're immediately pulling it apart. So I think there's a part to play on, on us as end users to be very clear and convey what the kind of requirements are to manufacturers. And, and we take, we've taken for a number of years now an approach of, you know, security by design, you know, in selecting new products. Security is one of the first things we ask. There can be a fantastic product, but it may not make it past stage one if the security is just completely missing or so poor with no real chance of it getting better. So then the manufacturers need to have an understanding of what goes on. You see a lot of articles written at the moment, magazines, and there's still a lot spoken about in terms of how to keep things secure. That it's really not very advanced. You know, we're still talking about you know keeping your antivirus up to date and doing this and doing that, rather than looking at how you can design security in from day one. And like I said, we as end users have to do that into what we build. I think manufacturers have a more of a responsibility now to really start understanding that because everything's on the network and it's, it, it's still not particularly impressive what you see out of a lot of manufacturers. Okay. Harsh but fair, I'm afraid. <laughs> so that's a really interesting point that Jonathan makes, Lucas, around, uh, you know, manufacturer launches a new product, new product range, another new monitoring tool to, uh, to go with it. Um, and for an organization like yours that's not just one end user, you're serving multiple end users and supporting them through, uh, through the VNOC. Uh, how big a challenge is that and what kind of conversations do you have with uh, the manufacturers out there about that very point, about maybe thinking, rather than developing their own tools, thinking about integration into existing tools? I have to admit it is a big challenge for us now as we speak we are actually actively looking for an ultimate solution for for remote support for for remote services and uh, it's not as easy as one may think uh, many of those tools you've mentioned will work with just certain type of devices or certain specific manufacturers uh, plus every uh, every customer um, is different uh, you are allowed to remote dial into some networks. Some networks are completely closed. Um, some clients will allow you to do certain things of a network while others will not. Um, sometimes you can use cloud services, which is quite easier for us usually. Sometimes you can't. Um, security is becoming, I fully agree, a big concern. Um, it's getting better in the industry, I can, I can say. Um, but also what uh, I would like to add to the previous question is uh, we also struggle very often uh, with manufacturers rushing new products to the market where the product is not fully finished, not fully tested and uh, you know they promise there will be new features or actually the, the features they were supposed to be on day one but uh, it's a hard journey sometimes. Um, so in general, yeah, it, it is really challenging um, to, you know, to introduce anything new which is, you know, not fully ready just yet. Um, and in terms of service, uh, it really depends on the customer. So uh, sometimes we will still have our engineer on site every day if the customer wishes, you know, uh, to, to use our services, uh, but we can see this slight shift uh, towards remote support, definitely. Uh, in fact, you know, our um, network operation center, that's how it's called at AVMI, NOC, uh, it's around half of our business these days. It, yeah, exactly. You know, projects, we, we do big projects, it's still, you know, big, big value for us. Um, but because AV is getting more and more complex, because it's uh, getting more and more integrated with customers' network, with IT infrastructure, um, the level of support required by our users is, is getting bigger and bigger. So that, that point about um, manufacturers bringing product to market 
uh, more quickly than we maybe experienced 10, 15, 20 years ago. And that becoming a bigger challenge because they're not always fully baked when they hit the market. Uh, are you all experiencing that? Do you see that as a major challenge? And do you, do you think there's a reason why that's happening, where it didn't 15, 20 years ago, maybe? It's speed to market, isn't it? <coughs> I mean, you've got to competition? Be you've got competition. You've got to be first speed out of the door. Um, you know, it, it, manufacturers have got to show that they're innovating, that they're coming out with these, uh, these solutions that we're talking to them about, you know, our wish list. Um, uh, but I think... I don't think it's necessarily too much of a bad thing if you manage it properly, because you know if something comes straight off the shelf, you know in my mind and you know in our mind at Deloitte, we're thinking right, we'll version, let version one go into the market and get that feedback, and we'll look at version two. Thanks very much. You know, it's we've only just we've been looking at uh, you know as an example the uh, the Surface Hub from Microsoft. We're just about to install. Well, this is their version one, which they've now. Stop manufacturing, but <laughs> we're just about to install those. Um, and but even even now, it took us ages to be able to get it fully deployed and fully integrated into our into our environment, so that we could get the best out of it. Um, it was a little bit of a shame that they suddenly shut the door on manufacturing and you know now just talking about their new version. Um, but it's you know for for us. We, you've got to let version one go out there, and there's going to be companies that are willing, you know, to take some of that, take some of that risk and be first. And you know, some of our innovative areas do take some products straight off the shelf, you know, as soon as it's come out from manufacturer and beta versions. But they're very closed off. They're not sort of live business environments. Um, they're more of our innovation spaces. Yeah. Jonathan, you were going to? Yeah, I think it's, it's an interesting one. This isn't it? I'm, you know, the. the yeah, the answer is agile, isn't it? Everything's agile these days. So, um, but I think that there could be a number of reasons to it. Sometimes it's a manufacturer, it's a speed to market. They want to get to market before somebody else. Um, and therefore, they're sort of getting a foothold by getting something out there. And unfortunately, we can then suffer from it because it may not be completely finished quite as smooth as it should be. But I think there's a, there's a, there's a part, so again, in all seriousness about agile, because it is how we have to work. And I talk about, this is agile with a small A, not a big one. Um, there's, and, and even with, with the big A, there's this concept of this sort of minimum viable product. It's all great, but that's when you talk about features and functions. But I think there are some things, and there's a good friend of mine who sort of termed this, he talks, talks about minimum critical specification. And I think that's something that goes missing sometimes with product, is, you know, and as I talked about, this concept of security by design. There are some principles that I think you should set yourself. You know, whether you're, whether you're an end user organization and you're putting products out there yourself or putting capabilities into an environment. As John says, you know, there's the experience and there's the capabilities that you, and then there's the products. And you can, you can do that from, from the end user perspective or from the manufacturer perspective. Think about those things that are critical to what you do. So in an enterprise environment, for example, security. It's a critical thing. There's no, you know, it's not very much of a gray area. You know, there are security teams that we have to go and talk to and, you know, the answer's no. Now let's talk about why you came here. Um, and, and You've got a no on the door at Deutsche as well, have you? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're getting we're getting much better at that, and it's you know it's a it should be a maybe yeah. um, or a yes, but but th there is that need to, to ensure that the minimum critical specifications are met for anything that you do, and we've got to get a, in terms of security, but also other things away from certain things being an afterthought. There was always a bit of a joke, I think, in the industry that management systems were always a bit of an afterthought. You know, you designed and built your product, you looked at what it was costing you, and if you had any money left, you'd spend that on building something you'd call a management control tool, you know, and then depending on how much money you'd got, depends on how feature-rich it really was. But I think that's key, is, is ensuring that we always meet the minimum, and then start looking in terms of your viable product, what are the features, what are the capabilities that I need to meet, you know, 80% of what it is I do, and always back to the good old 80-20 rule. And then you can introduce features over time. And I think that's okay when you bring a new product in. If you're looking at a manufacturer and you're seeing, right, you've got the fundamentals right, you've got my key features, you're, you're hitting over 50% over of my, my tick list, my wish list of the things I want, and I can see a roadmap and a way for me to feed in that can bring that percentage up to getting closer to 100% of it. And I think that's part of the approach, is just taking that it's a structured approach. It shouldn't hinder things in bringing things to market, because if you're doing this by design, it becomes 
second nature. You can do it very, very quickly for any product that you're bringing out as you baseline it. So that, that, that's sort of my advice from an end user perspective and from a manufacturer perspective in terms of how to approach them. Yeah, thank you. So that you're touching there on the actual requirement. So that's always the start of the process, right? We have to get a user requirement. We have to have a need that we're, we're looking at technologies to bring in to meet that need, uh, to meet that functional requirement. Uh, Dan, in your experience, you work with many clients. Um, what's that like? Does that experience working with different clients vary enormously? Are some very good at it? Are some very bad at it? Yeah, it varies massively. I mean, we've got a panel here of very experienced end users, um, but there are some end users out there without the same level of experience or understanding of the industry. <clears throat> and one of the things that catches out a lot of organisations who don't have this level of experience is someone, potentially C-level, will go somewhere and see something, and they'll come back and say, I want box X, Y, Z in all of our meeting rooms. And no one will ask why. Everyone will go and buy, everyone, they will go and buy 100 of them, 250 of them. And it's absolutely essential at that point in time, which is, I guess, what we bring to a process for those end users who don't have this level of expertise in-house, is, is we ask that question initially, because it's absolutely about the requirements. And we want to defer the discussion about manufacturers and specific boxes until the last possible moment in the process. Like I mentioned earlier, we're talking about experience and functionality is a key part of that. Um, what do you want to do in the rooms rather than how are you going to do it? Um, you know, the what's and the why's have to come, have to come first. I'd like to just jump back as well to the, um, the network security question and just say that um, there is a responsibility on manufacturers to consider that and to do better. There's also a responsibility on end users to share properly what it is they're looking for. And I was in an amazing meeting recently with a manufacturer of a wireless presentation tool, and the network security team said, your tool, you know, this piece of hardware is no good for us. Okay, can you tell us why? No. no. Can you tell us what your requirements are? No. Can you give us a view of your network topology? No. Okay. Thanks for the coffee, uh, and we'll, we'll try again in a year or so. I'd like to know you who know. the customer was afterwards, if you're prepared to share. <laughs> maybe, maybe tomorrow at the drinks, I'll tell you. Um, so, you know, it has to be a two-way relationship. And I understand the network security teams obviously, you know, closely guard the things that they're responsible for. But without that information, the manufacturers just don't stand a chance. John, do you find that uh, even in an organisation like yours where, y you know, you've got a team that are employed to, to develop this stuff, bring in new solutions, meet the user requirements, do you find that, that someone at a very senior level sees a new piece of technology and it, and it becomes a pressure or do you generally find you can manage those situations? Well, that never occurs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, there's, um, you know, when you think about the engagement between... Uh, the, the companies that are out there. So at a very senior level, most organizations connect. Um, most organizations now, their tech and non-tech leadership will be heavily tracking the technology market. It's very popular um, in every industry. And so eye candy will appear, right? Whether it's in a magazine, newspaper, um, C-level discussion between execs, uh, you're always going to have those points coming in. I think what you have to do is deal with each one individually. So the discovery process is extremely important. You shouldn't discount them because sometimes you get some great introductions from many unexpected locations. But you put it through the process, which is how is it going to add value? And what is it going to do for the organization? Um, and, and that's the critical part, that you've got to have the discipline to be able to work through that. Now and again, there'll be some big decisions that need to get made for various reasons and you need to track that and, and deal with it. But in most cases, I think 99% of the time, we've found that you know, taking the feedback, taking the input, understanding where the product or service could fit, what value it would bring, um, and how achievable it is to adopt it in the environment as well. Because you know, in some cases, there's some great products that we really love and, and they're really fantastic, but we will just never be able to deploy them. Um, and it wouldn't be economical for the underlying manufacturers of those products and services to change them for us. And that's just a fact of life, right? And we will always have someone join us out of industry who will say, I've got a great solution to that problem. 
and then you'll have to take them through why we cannot adopt that particular practice. Um, and that normally works in that process. Are there generally common reasons why that happens, or do the reasons that that happen vary enormously? Yeah, there's a couple of themes. Um, number one, that if you have a particular product direction and strategy, having two of them doesn't make sense, right? And you're just doubling up your cost, and you're not efficient, and at some point you're going to be called out in terms of cost and capabilities, right? So product direction is one. You need some standards. Number two is normally enterprise manageability. So great if you've got one or two scattered around your campus. But if you've got 2,000 of them deployed and you need to patch them, maintain them, know they still exist, and make sure that you're still interoperating with them, then they need that enterprise manageability. And the last thing is security. Um, we normally find when we do penetration testing, security testing, there's just not the level of security needed. And, you know, in a consumer-grade device that's going to be in your home, not an issue. If it's going to sit next to a payment system in a bank, ain't coming anywhere near it, right? Okay. Well, unfortunately, um, our hour's up uh, already. Um, I'd like to thank all of the panel for joining us this morning um, in the discussion. Um, thank you to NEC for giving us the opportunity to do this, and thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed it and found it of value. Thank you. Thank you.